Welcome to the third in this season of Overheard Conversations, these Sunday sessions. Before I forget, I am going to set the egg timer for 40 minutes, because for the next 40 minutes, me and Rob are going to be talking, and then um, we will have 20 minutes at the end for those of you who are with us live on the call to bring your questions and reflections and see where that takes us. One of the themes that's running through these conversations and you know, through all of the work that I'm involved in, in one way or another, is this question of the ways we make sense of the trouble that the world is in and the consequences of oh, particular ways of seeing and saying and framing things and the difference that that makes. And part of the trouble that the world is in, by no means all of it, rides under the name of climate change. And in this conversation and a couple of the others that we have coming up in the season, that will be coming to the fore. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Rob Lewis. And uh, Rob's name has been familiar to me for a very long time, because as some of you've seen in the, the first Dark Mountain book, on the first page, we published this poem that I've kept coming back to over the years. I went looking for the wild one. And in the closing lines of the poem, Rob wrote, meanwhile, poor scientist holds extinction in a palm full of numbers with nothing but data to howl with. And when I was finishing up uh, my book at work in the ruins, I wrote to Rob to ask for permission to quote from that. And Rob, you said to me, ah, it's kind of funny. I'm not sure I'd give the scientists such an easy ride um, now based on the work that I've been doing and what I've been looking at, the history of climate science. And so that's kind of the territory we're going to head into tonight. But first, um, I want to ask you just to, to tell me a bit more about where you call home, Rob. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, it's great to be with you, Dougal, and uh, great to see all of you joining us. Um, yeah, I live on the shores of the Salish Sea, which is uh, a relatively new term for this region. Uh, conventionally speaking, uh, we would be talking about the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which comes in at the northern tier of Washington State between Washington and Canada. And then uh, after it travels inland, it branches south into what's called Puget Sound and north into the Strait of Georgia. But a geographer a few years back uh, decided that we really need to understand this as a single sea, an inland sea. And he came up with the name Salish Sea. And Salish uh, also refers to the Coast Salish people. So it's a way of bringing us all together around this one water body and also recognizing the original inhabitants in one word, and a beautiful word, or a beautiful term, Salish Sea, it just rolls off the tongue. So I'm, I'm fortunate to live here. It's a, it's a very uh, rich part of the world, rich with water, which makes it rich with life. Uh, I have, uh, you know, just beside me at this moment, there are migrating waterfowl, there are harbor seals on the grass island. We see heron, we see eagles and all sorts of even sea otters. So it's a place I'm I'm continually in a state of gratitude and relationship with, but also uh, very much aware of the fact that in many ways I shouldn't be here. You know, the Samish people should be here. Uh, where I live was once, they believe, the site of a longhouse that housed 500 people. So to, to keep that, you know, just to have that in mind of where I really am, you know, uh, gives me a lot to think about all the time. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for letting us into the layers of the place that you're speaking from and the the layers of history and the the land and the water and there's there's so much there that I feel is kind of in the background of this conversation that I'm curious to to have with you about the history of 
climate science and the history of ways of making sense of climate change that you've been exploring and you know, the lens that you bring to it as as a poet walking alongside scientists and there are there are parallels between this journey that you've been on and that you are on and the one that led me to write at work in the ruins but there are also things that I had little awareness of that you've brought to my attention and I guess maybe a good place to start is just to ask you like, how did you pick up this trail? And that's a good way to put it, picking up a trail. I, it happened at a conference uh, nearby in Port Townsend, um, the Global Earth Repair Conference in 2019, and a particular workshop, which was called Ecosystem Restoration for Climate. And they had brought in uh, scientists from all around the world to give different parts of this puzzle. And by the time the workshop was over, my understanding of climate had transformed. Uh, I suddenly saw uh, not something in opposition to the, the usual CO2 focused understanding, but something parallel to, and as you've mentioned, the side of climate that's gone missing, and that's a good way to put it. Uh, one scientist uh, in particular really struck me, his name's Mian Mian, and uh, he, he's passed, but at the time he would have been around 79, 78. So he'd been around a while. And the story he told was that when he was young in his profession, he perceived a two-sided understanding of climate, that there was the atmospheric CO2 issue, but there was another issue which science refers to as land change. And uh, he was uh he did some editing for one of the first climate reports uh, produced in 1970 and uh his professor had written the chapter or the entire section of this book which was called um uh, climatic effects of man-made surface change and i was like okay so man-made surface change we're talking about habitat destruction we're talking about environmental destruction we're talking about environmentalism and and here this is being presented the unaware of that uh he also had a really interesting uh way of putting he was a bit of a poet in that he described his own observation from the place where he lived in the western mediterranean basin and what was happening and we can we can maybe get into this later because this is fairly complicated but just as a tease, uh, water begets water, soil is the womb, and vegetation is the midwife. So that that was kind of the hook that pulled me in. I was like, oh, there's, this is poetic. Uh, this is something much different than I've been uh, exploring. And that that's how I kind of stumbled into this. And then after that, it was just uh, realizing that, okay, this I have a lot of work to do I have a lot of I have a lot of studying to do a lot of research to do and I just dove in and one thing kind of led to another uh, but all along I was driven by the question why don't we know this mm. and that's something I'm still trying to get to the bottom of why don't we know this so let's see if we can draw out this um the kind of outlines of this uh, this history and its implications, because as I've come to understand it from you, what we're talking about is we've ended up with a picture of climate change in which the cause of climate change is described in terms of emissions. And then we kind of carve mm -hmm. up the emissions, where they're coming from, the different gases involved. But it's all about the stuff that is being put into the atmosphere. And then we talk about things like forests and ecosystems in terms of the consequences of those atmospheric changes and the ways that those play out. But what, what goes missing from this is the extent to which, you know, Forests, landscapes, ecosystems are not just you know, passive victims of the consequences of a changing climate. The extent to which they are always already involved in creating climates. And 
know, the thing that the thing that you heard at that conference that set you on this path was that that used to be part of the story that climate science was telling. And it's yeah. not that that was kind of then proven to be not significant. And that's why right. the shape of the story changed. That's not what happened. So just take us a bit further into, you know, that that earlier era of climate science that people like Milan Milan were um, very kind of central within. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, the notion, the idea that land affects climate is traditional climate understanding. Um, and uh, I think in the early days of climate science, uh, it was where people really kind of looked first. You know, one of the things that brought climate into the global uh concern at, at first was the drought in Sudan and in North Africa and Somali and uh, how devastating that was. And people began to realize, wow, climate can really create a lot of suffering. But if you look at that particular situation, it's land change. It's the destruction of so, of so much uh, rangeland and farmland uh, due to the imposition of modern ways of doing agriculture, also uh, due to a lot of um, land use uh, or efforts by the government to privatize land ownership. And so what happened is a lot of land got degraded. Uh, so this is kind of where, this is the milieu where all this got started and, and CO2 claim came into that later. And, um, you know, as far as I can tell, it what happened is that it's not like the the land understanding went away, but the CO2 understanding was so simplistic and so powerful, it just kind of pushed it out of the way. And one of the things I discovered is that prior to the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is considered the UN body that determines what climate science is, and you know, they're they're the the, the assessors. Prior to that, there was another organization called the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And this uh, organization was looking at the kinds of things we're talking about, the, the coupling between forest and climate and wetlands and climate. And uh, it ended up getting somewhat pushed to the side. It received about 10% of the funding as IPCC. Uh, journalists kind of seemed to ignore it. And then in 2015, it was just quietly shut down. Mm -hmm. So um, there seemed to be, uh, once, once the CO2 narrative really started to gain uh, power over the imagination, uh, it kind of just became its own uh, entity and kind of forgot its friend, <laughs> land change. And uh, many scientists are, you know, the, the land change side never stopped. Uh, and we've just learned more and more. And it's just, it's a matter of time before we have to bring this other understanding in because it's so critical to everything. So there's a, an, one of Milan, Milan's images is of there being kind of two legs to, yeah. um, to climate change as it was being right. studied in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, the the atmospheric CO2 side of it was one leg and the land mm -hmm. change and the active role of ecosystems and land use was the other leg. Maybe it would be helpful to, to illuminate this with the specific case from the Mediterranean landscapes that he had Yes, brought. yeah, <laughs> yes. Story of his and this is where This is where his insight, insight of uh, water begets water, uh, soil is the womb and vegetation, the midwife came in because he had a long history in the Mediterranean tracking pollution. So he understood the atmospheric dynamics really well there. But uh, there were increasing reports of the summer storms dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the kind of beautiful details of Mian's life is when he was a boy, his father would take him partridge hunting. And, his pop and at one time people used to be kind of uh, lay meteorologists, you know, they would have their own barometric pressure gadgets and, and people used to like to understand climate and how it worked locally. And his dad would show him how the summer storms developed across during the day and how they 
would form how his father was able to look at the clouds and say, you know, in three hours, there will be a storm up in that nest of mountains. And we'll take this route to get home to avoid the rain. And this was something they enjoyed doing. And then it was like 40 years later that the European Commission came to him after he'd become a professional with numerous degrees and asked him to figure out what was happening to those storms because they were dying. And what he discovered is that uh, though there was a daily sea breeze from the Mediterranean Sea bringing in moisture, uh, it wasn't enough to create on down the, the you know later in the mountains a storm. It needed something else. He called it a carrier component, but it needed to be triggered. And it was the land that traditionally had done that. Uh, Pre-Roman times, the that area was pretty lush. It had vast marshes in the uh, lower plains. And of course, the coastal marshes, it had great oak forests. So the sea breeze would come in with a certain amount of moisture and it would travel over the land, pick up more moisture. And then by the time it, it started to travel up the, the hills, about 80 kilometers in, inland, it would have all the ingredients to trigger a storm. Then that rain would fall and it would enter the land and replenish the aquifers, particularly down in the marshes, and the cycle would begin again. So in the summertime, even though the broader meteorological pa patterns were, were not bringing rain into the area, the land was. And it was a critical time for the rain. This is one of the problems with uh, the, the, the global modeling is it's all averages. And when you look at climate, it's all timing and place. And, you know, life has worked out, you know, wherever it is, these ways of sustaining itself and bringing water to itself because life needs water and water needs life. Mm -hmm. That was the key insight of Milan's understanding is that water begets water, that life is water. A tree is standing water. And in order to have lots of water in your environment, you need not lots of life to, in, se in a sense, milk it from the flows that are going by. And if you take out that life, there's nothing to grab the rain as it goes by. And even though you're right next to a sea, you can dry out. I, I just what you, Yeah, go ahead. I want to pause on that because that's an extraordinary image of oh, the, the, the trees, the forests, milk the atmosphere yeah. the atmosphere yeah. not conceived of as a global average but the atmosphere in a particular place of the air and the wind and the moisture that is passing over this landscape at this moment in the day at this moment in the year right it's, it, it seems to me that you know as soon as you put the land and um life and water into the center of focus of the story of climate. Climate emerges as this astonishing, you know, weave of intricate, intimate interrelation in particular places. Yes. And that, you know, having spent a lot of time around the sort of you know, louder public um, gathering places of the interface between climate science and the public sphere, a lot of the time what I see is very much a kind of global dashboard representation where everything is the numbers that give yeah. a total global average way to put it. and the map of the whole world with these kind of large arrows marking, you know, trade winds and um, ocean currents and so on. And it's not that that's not of this patchwork. It's just that, you know, it's quite a low resolution. Uh, yes. with both of the things that that occupy the focus and so you know, this question of like how how did the work that people like Miyam were doing get sort of not in any dramatic way but just gradually pushed to the edges while the co2 focus and the emissions focus the atmosphere focus took up the center stage as climate was rising higher and higher on the global political and media agenda has to do with that complexity as i understand it is that right mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah you really put your finger on it 
And, and the conference I'm headed to is called Embracing Nature's Complexity. And that's what these science are trying to do. And of course, it's hard to tell a complex argument next to a simple one. And I think people like you and I and, and everyone here knows that. We experience that. We're always up against simplistic narratives, right? And we're the ones saying, yeah, but what about this? You know, what about the subtleties? So for me on, what's happened with him is uh, he would always say they just can't see it. And he's speaking of the modelers. Because as you said, the models are very broad. They have these wide domains. Um, you know, they, 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 they chop the earth into grids and a global circulation model will have grids of hundreds of kilometers on each side. So how do you see <laughs> in, in squares that big? How do you see the details Milan's uh, dealing with? And uh, he was invited to uh, participate in the third IPCC report, and he quit. He's, you know, he said the, uh, the modelers couldn't see what I was showing them, but they didn't want to see it. It was inconvenient to their work, uh, and they argued. And he was running an 80-person scientific institute. He didn't have time for it. And he, he also had a pretty short temper. And, uh, you know, you think of science as really congenial, and it is because it needs to be, and everybody needs to, to, to I think, operate within a certain cordiality, you know, and... But he had some pretty colorful language for how he felt <laughs> about being ignored. And he felt he never really won that battle. He mm. kind of felt like he had failed in the end. Mm. Uh, so another thing that strikes me as I've been you know, following the work that you've been doing is partly because you're a poet, you're very attentive to the images, the metaphor. Mm -hmm. And... You know, to the extent to which science is always being done with and within images and metaphors. Mm -hmm. Not just that, you know, good science communication requires images and metaphors to translate the science, but actually the framing for uh, where the focus is, where the measurement gets done, how the modeling gets done, that is also kind of framed by metaphors and images that are upstream of it. And so I've seen you approaching from different directions, this question of, you know, the things that went missing and the significance, the consequences of them having gone missing from the way that we're generally talking about, um, about climate. And for example, there's this, uh, there was a post that you had, um, which you, you titled, the earth is not a person sleeping. And maybe that's another good piece for you to to bring to the picture that we're we're assembling here. Just to tell me a bit more about about that image and how you began yeah, to yeah. popping up. Sure, that's a good one. Um, so I heard a scientist, a traditional physicist, um, and uh, kind of a CO two only oriented uh, individual describing the greenhouse blanket as this blanket that covers a person sleeping. So that's where the Im image came from. It was a good image because it was right and wrong and it allowed us to see how. The blanket is there. You know, the greenhouse blanket is all too real, but the person underneath the earth is not sleeping. The earth creates the, the atmosphere for the greenhouse blanket to be in. You know, the earth is the, is the regulator and maestro of climate. If climate were an, uh, a symphony, the earth would be the conductor, um, or Gaia would be the conductor. And, and another way to look at this is uh, with arrows of causation, the CO2 model has everything sitting under this atmosphere, which is all determinative, and all the causation comes down from the atmosphere to the ground. But there's another level at which causation is coming up from the ground to the atmosphere. So if you uh, clear cut a forest, you not only immediately heat up and dry out the, that area, you're also affecting the amount of moisture that's traveling downwind to other places. So the way to think of climate is uh, with both arrows, one coming down, one going up, and maybe a circles, you know, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you pointed out to me that you know there's the the film that got a lot of attention a couple of years back, Don't Look Up. And right. uh, obviously in the in the film, uh, the 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 thing that everyone's not looking at is the kind of that's coming and that's going to hit the earth. But actually, you know, part of the part of the power of the image of that title is that it's also pointing up to the atmosphere. But as you yeah. said to me, you know. Actually, up is the only direction that we look when we talk about climate. We don't notice the part of it that's here and around us, as well as the part of it that's up there. Yeah, we don't look at the womb and we don't look at the midwives. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and the womb, I love that image for soil because it's not seen. You know, we don't see what's going on there, but what's going on there is so important, you know, like a womb. It, it is over time producing uh, the means for life. Um, one thing that uh, healthy soil does is it holds a lot more water. Mm. And, um, you know, environments need that water at different times of the year. And without the soil holding it and banking it for uh, the, the vegetation, things can collapse very quickly. And of course, the, the image of uh, vegetation as a midwife delivering, you know, bringing up and delivering that moisture into the atmosphere is also mm. delightful. And it, it just helps you feel what's, what's actually going on around us. Um, I remember after that first session uh, that I mentioned, the conference, uh, looking at this big old maple, and I was kind of like seeing it for the first time. I realized it just wasn't a tree. It was a tree attached to all kinds of other things. It was a tree attached to what was happening under the soil. It was a tree attached to what was happening with water cycles. And um, this is something that has happened with me um, that I mentioned in my last piece, our ecology and climate, the same thing. I started out trying to understand climate and I ended up in ecology. I ended mm -hmm. up in relationships. Uh, I ended up seeing not just objects or, or things like trees and plants and soil, but what's going on between them that's invisible. And I often wonder if we could see the atmosphere, if we could see the, the heat and how it's being carried by moisture through the atmosphere, we might be floored by the beauty. But it's just something we don't see. So, so we're, we're missing out on this experience of life that is really around us but uh kind of kind of hidden so i think one thing that happens when whenever we try and have a conversation that is saying you know something important is lacking from the way in which climate science is being done or framed or presented is on the one hand, uh, it can be heard as or kind of appropriated by people saying, you know, it's not as bad as they're telling us it is. Um, and precisely because of that, there can also be a kind of tension that comes from the other side of going like, you know, guys, stop muddying the water. This situation is too serious for all of this nuance that you're trying to bring to it. You're just going to confuse people. You know, adding all of this complexity just takes us to a place where you know, we can't get a grip and we need to get a grip really quickly because we've only got a few years to act. And you can hear yeah. how the kind of the dominant understandable languages of talking about climate change grab onto or just obscure the kind of conversation that we're we're trying to have here. And And part of what I appreciate about the way that you've been working to tell this story is it's really clear you know, reading your work, um, that you know, there is there is no sense of wanting to play down the depth of the trouble, the urgency of the situation, in the way that you're describing it. Like bringing this other side of the the climate into view is not a you know is not a way of lessening our con concern or sense of seriousness. But also, it's not just a kind of um, 
you know, insignificant addition of nuance. Actually, there are consequences to this stuff yeah. having gone missing from the way that we're mostly talking about climate. Um, and I think we probably both have some thoughts about that, but I, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about like, what you see like, having been walking yeah. for a few years as the consequences of this. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, they're complex. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're kind of two-sided. One is that we're even in bigger trouble than we thought. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have a blanket thickening over the earth, we're destroying the earth's ability to deal with it and to run a climate. And uh, one of the scary things about uh, what scientists who study this are telling us is that a system can shift. You know, you have thresholds where you can damage and damage a system and it will hold up, but then it reaches a point where it can't and it just collapses. And you can go from, you know, a forest to a desert ecosystem, and then you're really in trouble. So that's that's the one side that it it actually makes us realize we're in bigger trouble than we realize. But then there's the other side, which is that we realize we have more power than we thought we did via our landscapes. Uh, when you see the power of a landscape to recreate and uh, regenerate uh, rain cycles, and it's able to do it in just a matter of years, it gives you great hope, real hope, hope founded in, in, in the power of the land. Uh, Rahendra Singh is known as the water man of India. And he uh, reintroduced uh, indigenous ways of managing water, which simply meant pulling the water on the land during the monsoon season so it didn't just all flow away. And then it would percolate into the aquifers and it would continue to hydrate the land year round. And he was able to recover entire rivers this way. He was able to bring uh, farming that had been abandoned back to the land and bringing young people back to the land. Um, so there's a hope there and, and hope can be misused mm -hmm. to try to not face reality. But when the hope is in the land and when you consider that we've already uh, degraded 75% of the land surface of the earth and you get a sense of the scale of potential we have for regeneration uh so yeah it's, it's utterly it's taking me out of that doom that certain doom i felt with the co2 only narrative uh that's and, that's incredibly yeah. important i i just want to pin that down because i think that's going to be a theme that's going to run through several of these conversations is there is a there is a kind of doom that is you know that's often narrated as realism but that is a kind of a realism of the global dashboard of the mm -hmm. satellite yeah. side view of the world and uh, the kinds of agency that arise from that lens that way of seeing the world which is based on commensurability you know it's based on using kind of it's based on co2 as almost a a currency of crisis, CO2. Mm. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, a single number into which we can yeah. process things. And I mean, Charles Eisenstein pointed this out in, in his climate book, which touched on some mm -hmm. of this stuff, where mm -hmm. he, he kind of said, you know, we used to talk about saving the whales. Now we have papers that present the contribution of uh, whale shit to <laughs> urban sequestration right. and, and if next yeah. year someone comes with a paper that shows that actually the whales are negative from uh yes yeah you know to analysis perspective then we're going to want to exterminate the whales and this is <laughs> this is not a sane way to to go about things but i think that there is a you know the co2 lens and the global dashboard perspective encourage an oscillation between a kind of a despair that is based on thinking we know more than we know and a form of agency that is hubristic because once you're when you're looking at everything on these global averages then you want to like it it encourages thinking in the direction of 
you know, global scale geoengineering. Um, and it encourages thinking purely in terms of kind of industrial aggregation of uh, inputs and outputs. Whereas the kind of agency that arises from the work that you're bringing into the foreground has to do with getting involved with land and oh. with life. And if, you know, the capacity that humans have and have had and continue to have to show up as contributors to the, the life of places and landscapes rather than, you know, purely as, um, as destroyers. And I get more and more convinced that, you know, uh, recovering a story of what it is, has been and can be to be human that doesn't simply present us as a plague is, yeah. is, is one of the things that environmentalism has failed at and kind of often abandoned, even when it's operating in its hopeful mode, because then it tends towards a technocratic solutionism that still has a very dark picture of human nature written into the core of it. Whereas they think that there is, you know, once we recognize climate as this thing that's intensely local, then the fact that we are as creatures intensely local, we're small, we're limited, we're embodied, uh, mm -hmm. of, of a role and a contribution in the way that the, the big lens can can do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I try to look at uh, this other understanding of climate, what I call a living climate understanding. Mm -hmm. So climate according to life uh, is as a portal back to our roots, as a way of seeing the earth again, seeing life again. Because uh, that's what's happened with me in studying this, is I've gained this fresh appraisal for life. And uh, just walking down the road, I have a lot more wonderment than I did before. Um, and it's, and as you point out, the, the CO2 uh, view is very powerful in the sense that it's taking us out from what seemed to be starting in the early seventies with environmentalism and, you know, this call to return to a human relationship with the land, the CO2 only, you know, global dashboard, big computer model takes us almost back to like uh, the, the, the age of reason, the enlightenment time when, you know, the earth is just a bunch of objects that we can manip manipulate with dials. So it, it's not just a simple way of looking at climate. It, it actually trains our thinking in a direction that we really shouldn't be going, that, that one would hope we were leaving behind, not re-entering anew, only on a grander scale. And I think it's, you know, it's worth wondering about the, the strange compatibility, let's say, between the, you know, what we've ended up in this conversation calling the, the global dashboard way of seeing and describing climate change that only that, that, that leans on one of the two legs of the earlier work. It's that fits an industrial lens yes. and yeah. it's like mentality of an industrial society. So in a strange way, you know, as environmentalism and climate change uh, crept onto the agenda of um, the adults in the room, to use that phrase from the, that Yanis Varoufakis lifts from Christine yeah. that I talk about in at work in the ruins, like as it came onto their agenda, you know, part of what's going on here um, is that you know this way of looking at it fits the way of looking at the world that belongs in those rooms, in those conversations, in those business schools. And therefore, even though, you know, with good heart and good intentions, you know, the people lifting it forward and, you know, pushing the urgency and the importance of it are trying to call attention to this fundamental crisis arising from an industrial way of inhabiting the world. Nonetheless, it's fallen into a way of describing that crisis that, uh, that fosters the sort of the doubling down on industrial oh. objects, which was exactly the, you know, the thing that was the sort of source of alarm for me, I guess, when I was, um, you know, starting to write the book. Yeah. Yeah. A mechanical way of thinking of climate leads to mechanical solutions, the technological solution. And of course, this is a real 
conflict for environmentalism. Um, I just read about um, the new leader of the Sierra Club. He wants to have a 50 state, uh, you know, oriented organization because each state has its own green technology goals and the Sierra Club needs to be there to make sure they happen. Mm. Uh, whereas the local Sierra Club members who attachment may not be to this global program, but their own land are going to be coming up against what the national office is trying to impose on them, which is a lot of land damage. And we're talking immense acreage. Um, I did one little uh, analysis uh, in uh, looking at uh, a Princeton study, and this is just for the U.S. to to you know enact the net zero program would require from two hundred fifty thousand to one point one million square kilometers. So if you cut it in the middle, that's six hundred seventy five thousand. Now. Recently, or about a year ago, there was a study about how the U.S. Uh, biodiversity is faring, and it's not faring well. It's, 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 it's in crash mode, and the main cause is land destruction, mm -hmm. and the scale of land destruction that's creating this biodiversity crash is 6,200 kilometers, square kilometers. So how, if we can't, if if the bios, if the America's landscape can't handle 6,200 square kilometers a year of land development, how's it going to handle 675,000? Hmm. And and who's not noticing this? How does something like this not get noticed? Uh, hmm. That's one of the things. That, and of course, you know, we 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 talked about this as starting with the science trying to grapple with this and kind of splitting it apart, the CO2, the land change, and then kind of going with the CO2 and kind of ignoring the land change. But eventually politics and economics takes over. And that's one of the things Mian talked about is he felt the reason why he was having so much trouble getting anywhere is because politicians didn't want to hear what he was telling them. Mm. Uh, they wanted to be able to continue promoting tourism, which was a cash cow. And um, now I don't want to make accusations, but you kind of have to start putting these pieces together. Um, that what we've now created is a self-propelling creature that is now getting hundreds of billions of dollars investment for development. Mm. You know, and the arguments they are making as to why environmentalists should accept, you know, losing so many square miles of forest for a uh, solar development are the exact same arguments environmentalists used to come up against with any development. Mm -hmm. We need this so we can continue our civilization. And we're going to take careful precautions. Don't worry, everything will be fine. And we've heard all this before. So where are we headed? Well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for kind of bringing this trouble to um to people's attention and you know putting your words and, and your attentiveness in service of you know not allowing us to get stuck with with convenient simplifications let's say right. in the light of what you in light of what you've just been talking about so at this point we're going to say farewell to those who are watching the recording mm -hmm. on youtube but those who are with us here i'm going to unpin uh, Rob and myself, and we're going to take your questions.